since it's been a while that we've been in the book of Romans, because like, we had those three sermons on the DNA of the church, and if you're new, uh, I would submit, go online and, and look at those uh, three sermons to tell you what we're about as a church. But today we're back in Romans. One of the things we're about as a church is moving quickly through Bible books. <laughs> Uh, yeah, kind of not. Uh, very methodical uh, and systematic as we work our way to help you learn how to think as a Christian uh, and, uh, and, and obey the Word of God with precision. So one of the things that we need to do is review because we're in chapter 4, uh, but it's been a while, so brain cells have died, I'm sure, etc. I'm Marty, in case you forgot who I was. Um, we want to review just a little bit about like what is Paul talking about before we get to chapter 4. So it's going to take a few minutes. So uh, we want to begin our review by asking a simple question that is the background question for the first three chapters. Here's the question. And it's the question of all of life. How does a sinner become a saint? That's simple. That's the question. How does a person born with Adam's sin become, well, one who's a saint in the, in the eyes of God? Um, how do you get, as Paul's going to say in the first three chapters, he's going to use a, 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 a political or like a, a legal term, justification. It's a, how does someone step into the courtroom of God and who's, who's criminal in their behavior and find the gavel coming down and God says from his throne, you are justified, you are declared righteous, your, your sins wiped clean. How does that happen? You have two options. <clears throat> Option number one is that you believe that uh, you get into God's presence by faith alone. That was the claim of the Reformation, was it not? You're saved by faith alone. Uh, the other option is, and there's only other one option that you could appeal to, is faith in God, whoever he or she in our culture now, maybe, uh, plus perpetual works to maintain that relationship. Those are your options. Uh, our world uh, is really... Uh, misled into in understanding how a person gets into the presence of God. When you study uh, systems that are not uh, Christian systems, uh, they all have several key components about them. Um, but one of the key components is they believe in option two. Now we must have faith in God, whoever he or she may be, plus perpetual works to get saved, as it were. Um, one of the last doctoral classes I took before I finished my doctorate in apologetics, uh, I specifically took an a, a independent study with a professor uh, and it was weird because we had actually gone to Dallas Seminary together. Now he's my professor. That was weird. Um, but I approached him and said, can we do this topic? He said, great. So I, I did a class on, because uh, I have family members who are Jehovah's Witnesses. And then I had many, many friends that I grew up with who were Mormons. Um, and so I had a great uh, love and, and compassion uh, for those people. Uh, and I, when I was in high school, I was... Uh, after four years of German, I was the uh, German aide for all the German classes. And here Isaacson uh, was the head bishop or whatever they call him at the Roman church, um, uh, Mormon church. So he and I had many theological discussions uh, uh, in German and English, I think, uh, comparing faith, you know, which faith is a true faith. I had never said, and I had studied Mormonism in great detail because most of my friends were Mormons. I studied their theological system as a young man from the very get-go, uh, but I'd never sat down and read their writings. Uh, I'd read them in sections, but not all the way through. In a doctoral program, they hand you a ton of books and tell you, here's your life, enjoy, read all of these. So when I took that independent study on Mormonism um, in that doctoral class, I had to read all their writings. I'd never done that. So I read the Book of Mormon cover to cover. I read the Doctrine of Covenants cover to cover. I read many of the Journal of Discourses by Joseph Smith, things that he thought. I mean, original source document stuff. I mean, what do they, they believe? And as I was reading through the Doctrine of Covenants, uh, well, all of those books, I made many notations. And I was reading on my iPad so I could easily mark a page and then create a note. And then uh, I use a, you know, create a note and then you come back to the note later as you give it a topic. When I finished reading hundreds and hundreds of those pages, I found out that I had a strain of notes that were on the same topic all the way through the documents. What was the note? That you're saved based upon faith and their version of God, which is dramatically opposed to our version of God, which is another subject, and works, works. It was everywhere. Now, if I were to ask my friends that are Mormons, and one of my really good Mormon friends came to my sister's funeral. He's a worship pastor uh, at a, like Darren, at a Mormon church. Uh, his name's Rudy. I've known him for most of my life. Uh, he, he's close to my sister. He came to the funeral. I mean, we met and sat and talked in the living room for a long time because uh, now I'm a pastor. Uh, and it was, it was interesting talking to Rudy, but uh, he still bought into the system. So if you ask, you know, ask Rudy, do you believe in God? Absolutely. But the question is, which, well, which God? And then if you were to ask Rudy, like, how are you saved? He, he's he's going to tell you, you know, I'm saved by faith. But then when you drill down, well, really? Well, not really. You're, you have to do all these things. How do I know that? Because I read their books. Here's a case in point of how a sinner is justified by God according to their system of belief. 
Um, we'll start in Doctrine and Covenants, uh, chapter 1, verse 32, section 1, verse 32. Uh, notice the works salvation nature of this. He says, For I, the Lord, cannot look upon uh, sin with the least degree of allowance. Nevertheless, he that does what? The sinner. What does he got to do? He must repent. Are you good so far? I'm good so far. Then there is the coordinating conjunction. Uh, you got to repent. And what? You're still wondering what a coordinating conjunction is. It's <laughs> and. <laughs> Yeah, and repents, uh, it repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven. I have some questions. Okay, I got the repent part, you know, because that's, that's Romans 10, 9. You know, I, I got that confession of who Jesus is and repenting, being saved. I'm not understanding this, and you must do these things. I mean, it says you must do the commandments of the Lord. Hmm, which ones are those? I mean, like exactly. I mean, I like to know exactly which ones those are. Because if I happen to miss one, and it says I must do them, I might not get in. And then it says I must do them like, well, suppose I don't do them for like a week. But did I lose what I had? Suppose I'm carnal for like a month. I mean, a minute. I mean, how much doing must I do? Which commandments? And, and if it's not just the Lord's commandments, it's if, if it's the commandments, whoa, that's a whole nother question. Because then I'm talking about the Old Testament, how many commandments are there? How many? We test at our church. You know, just a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, Ten, the ten big commandments, right? Are, are you you're privy? Yeah. Then how many more were there? 613 more. Whoa. Are you talking about that, doing all those? I mean, I'll never be able to do all those. That's the point. Uh, moving on. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants section, chapter 5, verse 21. Now I command you, my servant Joseph, to repent. Okay, I'm good. There's that coordinating conjunction. What is it? And do what? And walk more uprightly before me and to yield to the persuasions of man no more and that you be firm in keeping, notice the participle, present tense, perpetual, keeping the commandments wherewith I have commanded you and notice the conditional clause, this protasis apotasis. So if you do what? Well, if you do this, this perpetual obedience, well then behold, I will grant you eternal life even if you would be slain like martyred. So if you do this, this is the if-then clause, then you're going to get this. How am I going to know I did it enough to actually get it? Well, you never know completely. You'd hope. But you're just amassing works that maybe on Judgment Day, God looks at your life and says, wow, stellar moral spiritual life. I'll let you in. Uh, moving on. Here's another passage. And I think that says Book of Mormon. It's supposed to be Doctrine and Covenants, section 6, verse 13. It says, if thou wilt do good, yea, and hold out faithful to the end, thou shalt be saved in the kingdom of God, which is the greatest of the gifts of God, for there is no greater gift than the gift of salvation. Do you see a dichotomy here? On the one hand, they're telling you what? Am I, are we going too fast? Okay. On the one hand, what are they telling you? You got to do. You got to do to get saved. On the other hand, they're telling you it's a gift. These are two diametrically opposed concepts. You don't work for Christmas gifts under the tree, right? Why are you laughing? <laughs> well, in our family, we do. <laughs> yeah, sorry, you don't have any under there. Bad year for you. No, you're just, <laughs> you're just piling up those gifts. Why? Because you love them. It's a gift. You're not working for it. I mean, think about it. It's unbelievable. Moving on. Uh, what was that? Did we cover nine? 14? We, did we cover that? We didn't. After you preach three times, it kind of they all starts bleeding together. Um, stand fast. Didn't we read that? Stand fast in the work with I've called you. Yeah, we we, we that one. Here, okay, the, the next one I want to look at is the. Oh, we didn't. Oh, okay. I'm 60. Just go with it. Okay. So, so gracious. This is not a legalistic church. We're flexible. Okay, back to the sermon. Okay, so stand fast in the work with I have called you, and a hair on your head shall not be lost, and you shall be lifted up the last day. So what's the key verbiage there? Stand fast. Like, oh, suppose I don't stand. What stand fast mean? Exactly. Etc. Last verse we'll read of many, many we could have chose from. Verily, verily, I say unto you that except you abide by my law, you cannot attain to this glory. Whoa. Okay, exactly which law are you talking about? I mean, all the law listed in the, in the Doctrine and Covenants or all the law of Jesus? I mean, I mean, we're talking just Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Is it the Olivet Discourse? I mean, is it the writings of Paul, the writings of James? Is it the Old Testament? I mean, what? Etc. See, if you're saved based on that premise, you're going to be tired because you're never going to be able to do it. 
Uh, why did I share with you so many texts? And by the way, that last reference, uh, section 132 from the uh, Doctrine and Covenants, I went all through there. Why? I mean, why did we look at multiple contexts throughout the whole thing? To show you, I'm not ripping them out of context. It's not isolated verses. It's everywhere that you're saved based on what premise? Belief in God plus perpetual works. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. See, Paul understood that kind of thinking because he was a Jew who was a rabbinical Jew steeped uh, you know, under uh, Gamaliel uh, of being a great rabbi in Judaism. Judaism and Mormonism are very similar in this one respect about the law. Because what did, what did Judaism believe? Well, according to Judaism, you had to believe in God, but their God's different than the Mormon God, but it's the same equation. They both believe in God. And then two, you have to perform the works of the Torah, the law. That's where they're similar. And Paul said, I used to think that you could get into heaven based on that. I had a slight problem when I ran into the living Messiah, the Messiah, who basically told me, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he got saved on that road to Damascus and he dropped his vain paradigm of belief of uh, belief in God and works to get saved. And he became a Christian that day, radically changed, radically changed. He's writing in the book of Romans about the radical nature of the gospel of Christ. He, he started talking about it in chapter one, verse 16. And that's what he's talking about. And he relates it to the Gentile world in chapter one and says the Gentile world needs Christ. And then he turns in chapter 2 and 3, starts talking to his Jewish brethren who are wrapped up in the notion that, well, we're saved because we're Jews. Great pedigree. goes all the way back to Abraham. Uh, you know, my mother was a Jewish believer. Judaism saves us. We obey the law. And he's going to tell them that's not how you get saved. So they're going to basically claim he's a heretic. Paul, you're a heretic. Because nowhere does the Old Testament say that you, you have to just believe in God to be saved. Uh, and none of this, uh, where are you getting this from? Notice what he says in, uh, we're still reviewing, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. What did Paul say as he summed, summed up his argument to his Jewish brethren? Verse 20, it says, Therefore by the deeds of the law, no which flesh will be justified in his sight, for, the law is, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. For by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. See, that's what cults don't understand. They think they've got to do something. What did Paul say? He did it all. You can't do anything to redeem yourself. He says, what does obedience to the law do anyway? He says in verse 20, through the law is the knowledge of sin. All the law does is tell you, if you deviate from this, it's sin. You have a driver's license. This is personal. Yeah. You read the book, right? What's the book tell you? Everything you're supposed to do. You see a yellow light, what's it mean? Speed up. You see, see a red light, speed up if it just turned red. I mean, whatever. No, it's telling you, if you don't do this, this is then sin. Uh, the other day, I went with Nathan to um, uh, Jiffy Lube to a concert, because I used, you know, I'm sorry, I like, I like rock. So, uh, <laughs> so I went to, uh, it was Joan Jett. I mean, I know, it's going back. Uh, Joan Jett, and, and it was a Tesla. Awesome, country rock. And then Styx. I'm not talking S-T-I-C-K-A. I'm talking S-T-Y-X. Yeah, sticks. Yeah, it was good. Except I'm thinking the lead singer sounds different. And then it's like, I look, I'm on my phone during the concert. I'm like, it sounds different. He died like in 1999. I'm like, you're kidding me. Anyway, back to my sermon. So, so how many even know Tesla? And it's not a car. It was a rock band. Okay, you understand this? So Tesla sang that song when they came out, long hair. It's really bad when the people over 50 my age are you know, long hair and they don't move much anymore on stage. It's a lot slower. And so I'm sitting there, you know, it's loud. And I got in my earplugs, you know, the orange things. That's what you do when you're, you know, because uh, now you know I could actually blow my eardrums out at a concert. So, and I'm looking around at all the people around me. Number one, they all have earplugs in. <laughs> I'm serious. Blue, oh, green, all these colors. And then no one gets up out of their seat like they used to. You know, we have to tap people and start a fight. It's like, could you sit down? Everybody's seated. It's awesome. I love baby boomer concerts, but I'm sitting there. <laughs> and this is part of my sermon. Don't worry. This guy's really on a rabbit trail. No, I'm not. Because they sang that song, Signs. Remember the song? Remember this, that radical song? Sign, signs, everywhere, signs, plugging up the scenery, you know, messing up my mind, that whole thing. Remember the song? You got it? Yeah, and I'm sitting and listening. To, they're like, hold up your phone, man. Turn it on, you know, the flashlight mode and wave it through the air. And I'm like, that used to be... It used to be lighters. I'm like, this is weird. You're watching all these grown adults waving their cell phones. I'm like, I'm not doing that. That's weird. But anyway, 
So they're singing the song, signs, and I'm thinking theology as they're singing the sign, the song. You know what I mean? I'm probably, you know, the weirdo in the crowd, but I'm thinking, this is so theologically incorrect. Because <laughs> what are they saying? Man, get rid of all signs, rules, regulations, pull them down, man. Live free, enjoy everything, man, no signs anywhere. That's what they're saying. I'm thinking to myself, I'm looking at my ticket. It told me which gate to come through. I <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, wait a minute. I couldn't have gone through that premier gate over there. I had to go through this gate. And then, and then you know, then I walked to my seat, and it's like, I got to go to this section, this row, that seat. I'm looking at myself thinking, man, about 15 rows in front of me are some choice seats closer to the stage, even louder. I mean, can I move up there? Could I move up there? No. What the law say? The sign said, long here, freaky people. <laughs> you can't move. I'm stuck there. See? So if I were to move up there, could the law fix me? No, the usher would just come along and go, hey, dude, why, why are you there? That's not your seat. See, that's the law. The law can't fix you. As Paul says in Romans 3, we're still reviewing. He, he says the law just tells you that's sin. I mean, I went to go buy a T-shirt. I went down there to the T-shirt. And I'm thinking, man, I hope they're just giving them away, I hope, you know. So I go down there. I want to prove I was at the concert, you know. Because I bought a ZZ Top T-shirt the other day. I went, you know, went to that one. And so I was, went to get a T-shirt and these big signs, you know, if you want a Sticks T-shirt, 45 bucks. If you want a Tesla's T-shirt, 45 bucks. $45? Are you kidding me? There's no way. It's a sign telling me. <laughs> it's plugging up the scenery. You know, can we remove the sign and I can just walk out with the T-shirt? No. Did I buy one? No. I'm a pragmatist now. I'm back to my sermon. See, you know, they say they don't like signs. They really like signs because that's how they make money. See, I'm not, you know, I'm thinking. What does Paul say about signage? It just shows you that you're wrong when you deviate from the sign and go on the wrong gate at the concert. See, verse 22, he says, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus, it's for all those who believe. For there is no distinction between a Jew or a Gentile, in chapter 3, he says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift, you didn't work for it, by his grace through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ. He said a whole lot there. He just said, you do not get saved, justified, declared righteous in God's courtroom by your activities. It's only by faith in Jesus. Simple. The signage, the law, the Torah merely tells you where you deviated. It can't fix you and you need a savior. So now to my sermon. I told you that was a review. Jew sitting there thinking to himself, Paul, that's total heresy. This whole salvation by grace. I mean, where's that in the Old Testament? Well, he's going he's gonna to stop in chapter 4 and talk to his Jewish brethren because he loves them. And he's going to tell them, let me explain to you that justification by faith is God's timeless plan. That's what he's going to do. And we're only going to spend uh, 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 a little bit of time looking at the first eight verses where he develops his first point. So this sermon is only going to have one point. Not three, only one. And you're thinking, how could he talk for 30 minutes on one point? It's not a problem. Um, <laughs> What's he going to say? Justification by faith is God's timeless program uh, uh, in his mind. Uh, how do we validate that? Point one, he says, I see it in the life of Abraham and David, two Old Testament saints. If any Jew identified with anybody, it was with Abraham. So he begins with the Socratic question. What's the question? What should we say then about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? Or translated, uh, how did he get saved? Was it by faith in God or faith in God plus works? That's the question. Verse two says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he of anybody has something to boast about, but not before God could he boast. So he's, he's saying here, if anybody could be saved by works, it would have been Abraham. Because consider all the great religious works that he had. I mean, he's 75 years old. He's living in Ur of the Chaldees, you know, modern day Iraq, but he's, you know, in that whole, you know, area, Euphrates, the Tigris, etc. And that's where he's at. And God comes to him and says, I know you're 75, enjoying your senior years. Uh, but I want you to get on a camel with all your family, move, sell all your stocks, bonds, whatever, sell the home, move 600 miles across the desert uh, and drop down through, you know, northern Syria into Israel. And I want you to move over there uh, as an old retiree. What would most 75-year-old people say? God, you have got someone in this wrong room at the convalescent home. I mean, no, I'm not moving. What'd he do? What'd he do? He moved. He moved. Radically, he moved. 
And he gets there. I mean, just his moving is a stellar thing of faith. He follows God all the way there. He gives Lot the choice graciously of, you want the beautiful land around Sodom and Gomorrah on the south end of the Dead Sea? I'll take the scrub brush, but what do you want? I'll graciously let you pick. What a godly man. When his uh, nephew Lot gets uh, swept up in a military uh, movement, who's the aged man that jumps on a war horse with his soldiers to go rescue his nephew? <laughs> Abraham. Etc. When uh, God says, I'm going to destroy Sodma, uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and Admon and Zeboim because of their sexual sin, it's who comes to the rescue? Abraham steps in and he has a bartering situation with God. Uh, will you deliver the city for 50 people? Uh, maybe 40? Maybe 30? 25? I mean, etc. He's praying for salvation of those people and redemption because God's wrath's coming. Uh, what a godly man. And then Lot's delivered. I mean, but he's, he's an awesome saint. And Paul says, if anybody could possibly think about getting into heaven based on works, Abraham's the tip of the spear. But is that how he got into heaven? No. No. Because he quotes Genesis 15, verse 6. Paul says, for what does the scripture say? He says, Paul says to the Jewish brethren, go back and read the Torah. You know, you know the Torah. Go back in the first book. Genesis 15 says, for what does the scripture say? Uh, and he's quoting here from Genesis 15, which says, Abraham believed God. And notice the cause effect. He believed, and what happened? God credited to his account. If you're, if you're uh, into finance, he looked at the ledger sheet, boom, put in there, I'm going to give you my righteousness. He accounted it righteous to him, the sinner. But what was it? Was it faith or faith plus works? No, it's faith. Faith. Abraham believed what he believed. He believed that God could take a 99-year-old man, make him the forefather of a great nation, and bless the world through him, all gen Gentiles, all, all the goyim. He could bless all of them. He's 99 years old, and he doesn't have a child. You talk about faith. He could have looked at God and said, have you considered my wife? We're 90. We're in our 90s. Are you kidding me? You're going to give us a child? How's that going to happen? No. He believed that God could do the unthinkable because he's God. Talk about faith. The point is, if that's how he got saved, as it were, it was by faith in God's provision to do the unthinkable. What is salvation? It's faith in God can do the unthinkable, that he doesn't need you to perform works because you cannot because you're sinful. What's the unthinkable thing? That his son left glory to go bear your sin on a cross and rise the third day, and now he calls for you to come to him to be saved. That's unbelievable. That's the gospel. So if that's the way Abraham came, then that's the way all men must come. That's Paul's argument. Verse four. He says, now think about this logically. No one, uh, now to the one who works, if you've got a job, his wage is not credited as a favor, but, it, but what is due. So if you have a job, you're expecting about every two weeks, what's gonna happen? <laughs> you get a check. I mean, does your boss come to you and say, hey, here's your paycheck for the last two weeks. Uh, it's, it's total, it's based on the graciousness of my heart, the love and compassion that I have for you. You're thinking, I was at the Pentagon at 4 a.m. every morning. I didn't see the light when I drove in. I left at 7 o'clock at night. I didn't see the light when I got out. And you're telling me this is based on your good grace? You owed me this money. See, Paul's saying, if you want to work your way into heaven, uh, that's not the way that you get there. Because works is, it's not about a, a gift. It's about your, your labor. You just get paid what you're due. Verse 5, he says, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him, speaking of God, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as, as credited in his, his account as righteousness. He says, that's the way you get saved. Not working for it. That's something, that's not a gift. That's why the book of Doctrine and Covenants is erroneous. They're, they're telling you it's, it's, it's faith, but it's also, it's a work over here. Paul says, no, it's not. When you come to God in, in simple faith, believing he can do the unthinkable, which is save you a sinner, because he died for you and rose again, that justification happens at that moment of faith, not your works, not your works. And he says that that's not enough to think about. Think about old King David. I mean, talk about someone who gets sinful and needs a savior. Verse six, he says, just as uh, David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. He says, think about David. He became a righteous man, but not by works. He says, uh, quoting Psalm 32, a Psalm of David, a penitential Psalm, where David is reflecting upon his sin with Bathsheba, and the sin of killing her husband, having him murdered, and his sin of lying and all the things that he did. He's quoting Psalm 32 and he says, you know, Paul quoting David, 
Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man who's, who the Lord will not take his sin into account. Blessed is that person. How do you get to the point where God will look at your account and not see the sin there? Well, you can't work to make the sin go away. You have to believe that God in his love for you will wipe it clean, but you have to come to him like David did in faith. I mean, think about the sin of David. Verse three of Psalm 32, I'll read it to you from Psalm, Psalm 32. David says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all that day long. He said, when I thought about what I did with Bathsheba, I might've been enjoying knowing her and having her as a girlfriend, but my sin of adultery ate away at my life all day. He says, from day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. What's that? That's the conviction of God. He says, my vitality was drained away as with the fever in the, in the heat of summer. He said, I might have been living large, but inside I knew I was compromised spiritually and I needed, a, I needed forgiveness. I needed a savior. How did, how did David become clean before God? Not by works, but by faith. And by that faith, he, he was cleansed. Um, what does sin do if you don't have a savior? It eats away. That's what he says it does. It, it wastes away. Did you see the movie Alien? I'm just saying, in 1980, I know it's a long time back. It was the first movie that Liz and I went to on our first date. Uh, <laughs> and we wound up getting married because of that movie. I mean, uh, <laughs> not really, but that was our first date. I was, you know, my parents, my dad transferred to the federal building in San Diego with customs and took a job there. And you know the story. I mean, called me in LA, said there's some cute twins next door. You might want to come home. And I'm like, what? whatever for. Never let your dad pick your girlfriend. But anyway, so I came home and I'm, I don't know anybody in San Diego and, and she's next door. She's dating this weightlifter guy that drives a Porsche. And, you know, I'm like, he'd kill me if I even took her out. But um, so we, she, her mom coached her into just go somewhere with Marty. I mean, he looks lonely over there. He doesn't know anybody. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> and you can ask her. She, she didn't even like me. I mean, she's like, bookworm no way and uh and so anyway so our, so we decided to go on a date and so we went on the date and it's like the big movie where we actually went to mission bay to the beach we had a transistor radio remember those long antenna sitting on the beach chilling uh and uh, an ad came on and it said in space no one can hear you scream I'm like whoa that's amazing i gotta see that movie so we went, that was our first movie, our first date. We weren't even really dating at the time. Uh, and I was wondering, how am I getting my arm around this girl? You know, it was not a problem. Uh, <laughs> we were arm in arm through that whole thing. It's so scary. You know? <laughs> anyway. What's this got to do with the sermon? A whole lot. You know that, there's that part in Alien where, the, where they, they nick the beast and he starts bleeding and you're like, they finally got him. But his blood's what? Acid. They're like, oh no. It starts eating through all the decks, you know, and they're going from deck to deck. They finally end on the bottom deck with a little metal pin and just one little drip. Because if it had gone through the next floor, hull, they're dead. I mean, can't you watch movies like this and think, that's so spiritual? <laughs> I mean, it's like sin, isn't it? I mean, think about it. Because if it's inside your life, inside your ship, it's going to eat through all the decks. The only one who can stop it, well, that'd be Jesus. I'll tell you, movies are, it's a spiritual experience. What did David say? Hey, the sin eats away at you. What do you need? You're a sinner. You need a savior. He stops the corrosion. See how blessed is the man that comes to know God based on faith, not works. Because you can lay down and say, God, I rest in you, in your work. The, the problem is, uh, it's very difficult for us to get away from work salvation because it's built into our culture. Working is built into our cultural thinking, down to attending college. Now, how many students are actually leaving, like, shortly to go to college? Anybody? Or are they already there? And you're the parent. Did you take them for the first time? Did you? How many did this for the first time? My heart goes out to you. Hardest thing I ever did was took Amanda to college in L.A. I cried the whole way back up the state of California. Liz kept handing me Kleenexes. What has happened to you? And I'm like, Wow. This is so sad. I mean, where did her childhood go? Uh, so enjoy your children while they're home. But back to it works salvation. It's built into attending a college like Stanford University. Uh, in 2017, 42,497 students applied there. 2,140 were accepted. <laughs> Whoa. What were they looking for? Here's what they look for on their website. Uh, you have to have an ACT score of 33 or higher. 
That puts you in the top 50% of the applicants. Then you have to average, have a, <laughs> the average score of accepted students of the S ACT is 35. A perfect score is 36. Uh, then the accepted students will also need an SAT score of 1520 out of 1600. And you have to have a GPA of 4.18. Whoa, I thought it was like 3.0. I mean, it goes higher, you know? I remember when I played sports, it's like, I just got to get a 3.0 so I can play ball. But back to the thing. You got to have a GPA of 4.18, and you have to have a robust resume of extracurricular activities, leadership qualities, references, and recommendations, and be able to pay the $60,000 a year for said education. What's that got to do with theology? Everything. The mindset is, I got to do all this stuff. And I do all this stuff, I get in. And then you bring that into theology. Well, if that's the way it is, it's that school, maybe that's the way it is for God's kingdom. No, it's not. I'll change the SAT to a spiritual acquisition test. Are, are you with me? Spiritual acquisition test. How hard would it be to pass God's test to get in? You'd never pass it. There would never be a perfect score. You would never pass. Who's the only one who could pass that test? Jesus Christ. And he did. Now what's he do? He calls you out of your works-based concept to come to him in faith.